give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, His presence is with us. And that's all we need is the presence of the Lord. I don't need nothing else but the presence of the Lord. I can just feel His Shekinah glory. You may be seated for just a moment, and I'm going to have you back up, so don't get there. But I, want, I don't want you standing all the time that I'm talking prelim tonight. I feel healing here. I want to, first of all, thank God for that tremendous message that Mickey gave this church Sunday morning. I, I thank God I told her I don't know that I've ever heard her any better than she was that particular morning. And it touched a lot of lives to which I am thankful for. And uh, I, I feel the results of that happening in our church already. And we're seeing the results of that. I do want to ask you to pray for Pastor um, I, I have booked a schedule when, when we looked like everything was going transition and when Brother and Sister Shock decided to, to go the calling that they feel they've gone, I should have canceled my, uh, my uh, not 16 because that would have inconvenienced people, but I didn't and I was planning on being gone a lot while they adjusted, but I have starting uh, tomorrow the, the North Texas camp meeting. And I mean, we have a series of, uh, I make Deb tired over here, my secretary just talking about it, so I'm not gonna tell you. But needless to say, I'm here, I only miss a couple Sundays, and uh, maybe a couple Wednesday nights, I'm here. But it's the Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays that are killer. So for the next few weeks, if you just put me and Mickey at the top of your list, I, I know that God's gonna do great things at these camps, and I've got uh, three men's conferences to preach, we've got to go to Manila, and then we come home, and we're home a couple months, and we've got to go back to Singapore. But God is with us, and God is directing us, and God is going to give revival around the world from this church. And I can't tell you how at peace I am about what God is doing in our church. Uh, let me give you something to shout about. Monday night, we baptized seven in our prison service in the name of Jesus. And so yesterday I, I drove up to the church and I, I got out of the car and I saw two ladies over against the car talking and I said, hello ladies, how are y'all? And I greeted them and I walked on in the office. Well, later uh, yesterday afternoon, Jennifer came up and said, Pastor, I saw two ladies in nursing uniforms. They were two registered nurses. They had heard about our prayer room and they just came by to pray. And she said, so I took them in there. We had prayer together. And I got to talking to them. And when we got through, Jennifer baptized both of those registered nurses. And one of them got the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm happy, but I'm sad because Jennifer and I are starting a contest on who's going to win the most souls this year. And I should have had enough sense to go do that myself. But so... This afternoon, there was another lady that just came by, and she went by Jennifer. So Jennifer decided to tell her about Jesus and got to witnessing to her and tell her the great plan of salvation. And this afternoon, I'm, I hate to tell you, but Jennifer baptized her in Jesus' name. So. So now I'm getting on her. I said, if they, they're just pastors through, if you don't get them in my, discover my POA Sunday, you're in trouble. I'm going to tell you that. But that's 10 people just since Monday night that's been baptized in this church that I rejoice over. I, folks, that's a, that's a year's revival in a lot of churches. I thank God for that. So God is doing great things. Let's stand together now. Exodus chapter 2, and I won't keep you standing long. If you have your Bibles, and everybody, everybody say, everybody ought to always come to church with a Bible. Now, I'm not, uh, that was, I knew that would happen because it just, now I'm not going to get on you if you have your Bible on here. 
because I have my Bible on here, and that's fine. It's always good to have this with you, but if you can't, this is the next best thing. But you need to download a Bible on your iPhone or your smartphone or whatever you have so that you can follow the Word of God when pastor preaches it. And, and, and going into the Word, not only just hearing it, but seeing it is so powerful. And tonight, I want you to be prepared to stay in Exodus, uh, particularly chapter 2. We're going to work from there. Let's read together, if you would read this with me, Exodus 2, 23 through 25. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Now that's important. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto God by the reason of their bondage. And God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Tonight, I want to talk to you about breaking spiritual strongholds. Breaking spiritual strongholds. Could you put your Bibles down, and would you help me give praise to God one more time tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you, you may be seated. I really hope I help someone tonight. If it's just one, it's fine with me. I just want to help someone tonight. Someone said, I've got so many problems that if anything else goes wrong, it will take me two weeks to get around to worrying about it. Pretty good little statement there. Life has a way of building up on us and accumulating problems and pain. We all seek to camouflage them through various means, either through entertainment, some people drugs, some people sleep, some people business. There's people that try to cover or hide what their family or their mother, father, children may be going through to try to hide the difficulty. But in our quiet moments when the computer's off and the iPad's been put down and friends have gone home, we have to wake up and realize that we are not doing well. We entertained ourselves with these things to keep our mind off of the problem. Have you ever heard anybody when you say to them, I've been praying for you and your situation, and they said, I'm just trying to stay busy to keep my mind off of it. And I'm not uh, preaching against that. What I'm saying is, is when you get through being busy, the problem's going to be there. So we try to camouflage that pain and hide our hurts and the accumulation of life's problem. But God's people, Israel, here in Exodus, were undergoing a very painful situation. They were in bondage, and they were in bondage in a land called Egypt. We all know the general story of how they got there, and, but let me just put it here another way. They were being held hostage by a situation that would not let them go. So when I talk to you tonight about strongholds, or I may use the word bondage a lot tonight, I am speaking about your being in a situation or a circumstance where you are literally a hostage, where you feel like that you are held captive by this situation. You're in that situation where you feel trapped and you can't get out of it. It's not that you don't want to get out of it. It's not that you haven't tried to get out of it. It's just you can't because you're stuck there. And there's no relief or release in sight for your situation. It's like somebody in jail or prison. Nobody will post the bail and nobody's taking a key and unlocking the door and you're just trying to do the best you can in a situation which you are trapped in. So tonight to speak about bondage is to speak about an entrenched pattern of situations or circumstances that puts us in a hopeless situation in our lives. 
you can pretty much always know when you're in this scenario because it says that the children of Israel sighed. In other words, when there's a lot of sighing going on, that means you are wearied in your situation. It says they groan, they ache because of their entrapment. It causes an ongoing suffering and pain. And it says that this was God's people's situation when you mix suffering and groaning and sighing day in and day out, you pretty much feel like you are hopeless. You feel stuck that you're in this situation. It says they groan or they sigh because of their bondage. I have done that. Oh, Lord. When would this end? That, that, that's a sigh. I've had, I've had about all this that, that I can handle. You might be in financial bondage. You might be in a emotional bondage. You might be in a relational bondage. Or you might be in a circumstantial bondage. And you're stuck there. And many might feel stuck in a career that is going nowhere. Stuck in a relationship that seems to have no destiny or a design to get out of it. Tomorrow morning, many will get up and they'll go to work. And they'll sigh. Another day at the job, I've got to put up with this. And then many, when it is over, they will give a sigh because they got to go home. So what is the problem here? Why are they sighing and suffering and trapped? They're sighing and suffering and trapped because of where they are. They're in Egypt. And Egypt is a foreign land with a foreign king. Egypt is not home for them. They're in a place that is really not their place. This place where they are doesn't care about who they are, nor does it care about them. You can see that beginning in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Israel, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, The people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Verse 10. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them. Let they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. So get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, with their hard labor. In other words, where they were and the person who was over them cared nothing about them or their situation. And they came up with a situation to make life bitter on the children of Israel and to make life hard. When you look at verse 13 and 14, it says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor or labor vigorously in verse 14 and they made their lives bitter egypt appointed taskmasters to make life hard the devil egypt made taskmasters to make their life hard because the king of egypt and the egyptians didn't care about israel didn't like them and didn't want them and were out to destroy the nation of israel We call this, let me name it tonight, spiritual bondage or spiritual strongholds because the biblical principle is this. The New Testament says the Old Testament was written, listen, for our example. Or the Old Testament was written for in samples or examples that it doesn't seem to relate to us when you look at Egypt or Israel And it's a different time and a different place. But when you go to the New Testament, it says we're to look back to the Old Testament and to extract principles and guidelines that will govern and influence us even today. So though you may think Exodus chapter 1 and 2 was back then and doesn't deal with you, it is directly related with you today. And I am going to take it from Egypt and Israel and I'm going to bring it to Alexandria at 740 on this Wednesday night and break it down for you. You have to understand that where you live right now 
in America, from a biblical perspective, this is not home. The Bible calls us strangers and pilgrims passing through. And the Bible postures this journey for us of 70, if you're given three score and 10 or maybe a few, 80 years of age. And then you're through with America. You're through with this life. Or if you're blessed like I was to have my grandparents and my father 91 and my mother now 91, I am, I am really blessed. But as a whole, for someone in this day and time, to make it to 100 is an exception and not the rule. And what we have to understand is this is Egypt and this is the land that we're just passing through. And you've got to understand when you have all this bondage that's on you tonight that this is Egypt. This isn't heaven yet. This is Egypt. And the Bible speaks of the age in which we live as an age overseen by an evil king and an evil doer and the evil one. And you have to understand something tonight, and that is this. He doesn't like me, and the devil doesn't like you. He is the God of this world. The devil and his minions and his followers don't like me and you. And the more you follow God, and the more that you look like God, is the more he's going to hate you. And the more bitter he's going to try to make you. And the more bondage he's going to try to put you in. He don't like people that love Jesus Christ. He doesn't like people that dress holy and live godly and want to separate themselves from this world. Not only with inward but outward holiness to where we want to be separated from this world. And the more you follow God and the more you look like God, the less you're going or he's going to like you. If everybody likes you, then something is wrong with you. If you're getting along with everybody, something wrong with you. Watch out for any politician that everybody likes because that means he's not standing for anything. One of the new big New Testament principles, which is somewhat a parathetical statement, has to do with the issue of, of putting Christ as the Lord of your life. It's being publicly known as a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, help me right here. Because the Bible says there's a big negative to being associated with Jesus Christ in the last days. He told them when he looked at his disciples, he said, they hated me. And because they hated me, if you look like me or talk like me or walk like me or want to be like me or want to live like me, they're going to hate you. So time out. Let's, let's stop in the middle of this Bible study and get this understood. There's one way you can get out from under all this bondage is turn into an Egyptian. But if you're going to be an Israelite in this world, there's going to be bondages and bitterness and pain that's going to always try to be inflicted upon you. Because the devil wants to try to hinder you from going to heaven and take him to hell with him. So they hated Jesus. He said, they're going to hate you. That's why God is safe. You can be real safe with God. And, and don't want anybody to misunderstand me because I know Jesus is God and we're one in his people. But I want to say something here. It's easy for everybody to refer to God. Oh, I thank, thank God. Because you're not really separating yourself just with God. Because the Muslims believe in God. Uh, other religions believe in God. That they really do believe in God. But the thing that separates Christians and apostolics is when they associate themselves with the one true living God whose name is Jesus. You can say God and you can refer to God. I don't have a problem with that. That's your business. But I like to say Jesus. I just like to call that name Jesus. Because I want this world to know who I'm associated with. I'm not just associated with a God. I'm associated with the God. Who is the everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. And his name is Jesus. That's who I'm associated with. So it's not the God thing that's going to cause you a problem. Oh, we all love God. Muslims love God. Everybody, we all love God. 
The thing that's going to cause you a problem is when you stand up and say, I'm a Jesus Christ fanatic. He said, you're going to be hated for my name's sake. He said, you're going to be hated for my name's sake. So the negative side is that aligns you with Jesus Christ. There is rejection involved right now. I, I tell you what, I've got notes and I didn't get to finish Wednesday night before last. And I can see right now, I'm we'll get close to finishing this. But you let me tell you something. There is an anti-Christ, Jesus Christ spirit that's in this world right now. And we're battling like we had never battled on our campuses. You've got uh, uh, Christians. You've got the Muslims going fast. You've got the Mormons going fast. The fourth going is thing in America right now is witchcraft. And it is everywhere. They're now having sororities on campuses with, with witchcraft involved. And so you now are battling things in this day and time that daddy would have never probably thought we were going to face in this day and time. And you cannot identify with just being after a God or God. You got to know the God. You got to declare among the people his name is Jesus. And you got to let this anti-Christ system world know that I'm in love with Jesus. I'm in love with his name. I'm in love with who he is. Now, let me take that and let me put that to the positive side right here. He said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world that you are in. The principle is this. When you identify with me, you lose with them, but you win with me. But when you identify with them... You win with them, but you lose with me. So you've got to determine tonight who you want to win with and who you want to lose with. And I made my mind up when I was a seven-year-old kid. I don't want to line myself up with the Egyptians of this world and the Antichrist spirit of this world. Whatever I have to service, whatever I have to go through, we're sitting here as a bunch of Christians that's been blessed by God at POA. We're not living in persecution. But some of our brothers and sisters, this isn't in, in, in any of my notes. I'm under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But right now, there are some of our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted because of what they stand for. There are those that's had their head cut off because they were Jesus freaks and Jesus followers and Jesus fanatics. Let me tell you something. The day has come in our day and time that we need to let Egypt know. We need to let all of our friends know. We need to let our families know. We need to let everybody know. I am lining up with Jesus Christ. Because when I line up with him, I become a winner with him. That identification is very important. But at any rate, we have an evil king and in an evil kingdom and the people of God are living there. This is home for them, only to discover this is not a fun place to live anymore. They're not happy there anymore. And the things are getting worse and worse. And all of a sudden, it wasn't fun to live in Egypt anymore. You say, well, pastor, did you ever think they had fun? Well, I imagine it wasn't nearly as hard when Joseph was there. When Joseph was over the people, they had Joseph, and they, did, they Joseph loved them. Joseph took care of them. Joseph took the children of Israel down to Goshen, and when everybody else was starving to death, he was taking care of, of his people. They were those Israelites, but the Bible says all of a sudden it wasn't fun anymore because a new king arrived on the scene. So they're located in a foreign land and what the king wants to do is use the presence of Israel to further his agenda in Egypt. He wants to take the nation of Israel or the people of Israel and further his agenda. So he says, let's get them to build our houses for us. Let's get them to build our businesses for us. Let's get them to promote our economy for us. Let's use them up since they're living here. Let's use them, but let's use them for our purposes. So life gets hard and they begin to use them to promote the agenda of Egypt. It's the devil's business to get you involved with the Egyptian system. The devil wants to get you involved with this system. And the goal of our spiritual enemy 
is to get us to side with him. That is for us to operate on the agenda of hell rather than on the agenda of heaven. I want to stay focused on heaven. I want to stay focused on what God has for me. I want to keep my life centered on the things of God. So things get worse and worse. But when you get to the end of verse 23 of chapter 2, throw something our way. And the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage. And they cried and their cry for help came up unto God by reason of their bondage. The first part of that verse tells us they're in Egypt. But they, over the course of time, they consulted God about their bondage. And this is very important. Until things got real bad. Until things got intolerable. Until they couldn't take it anymore. It was only then that Israel consulted God. You won't find them consulted God until their bondage or their stronghold got a hold of them. So first of all, before the new king came, everything was fine. Everything was going good. Joseph was there. But when the new king came and Egypt was no longer a place to live with happiness, not only was it not fun, it got worse and worse until they sighed. So they're sighing and groaning and, and unbelief. And when it dawns on them that only God can get me out of this mess. There is a gap of time between them being in bondage and their recognition that this physical, social, economic, marital problem, money problem, home problem, kid problem, there is a gap of time to where they realize whatever kind of problem we are facing can only be faced spiritually. And tonight what I have come to tell this great group of people that came out here with a tropical storm headed right at us, what I have come to tell you is the only way you are going to be able to handle the bondage or the things that you are fighting in your mind or in your emotion or physically is the only way to handle is spiritually. That's what's got this church here and that's what's got me here is it's been the spiritual. It took them a while to make that connection between their social decline their employment pressure, their financial trouble, their maturing problems, their spiritual situation. This over the course of time, it took them for them to realize this is not about Egypt. This is not just about the taskmaster. This is not just about being in bondage. This is about something that we need to connect with God about. What I am in, what I am facing, what I am going through. It's not just about my personal problem and it's not just about my personal situation. This is God getting my attention to connect with him. And tonight what I have come to tell you, whatever you are in or whatever you are facing, it is God saying to me, saying to you and to me, I am getting you in a position to where you are going to connect with me and where together we will work and God is going to deliver you from the bondage that has you bound. One of the reasons many people stay in bondage a long time is because they never make that connection between the situation that they can feel, touch, taste, hear, and smell, and the spiritual issue that is tied to it. Everything that we're going through, there's a spiritual issue tied to it. And if you don't make that connection, we're going to stay stuck in Egypt. Tonight, my job is to get you to make a spiritual connection that I'm not going to be stuck in Egypt. I'm not going to allow the devil to control my mind to control my emotions, to control my family. I'm not going to allow the devil to control that. I am going to make a spiritual connection tonight. So their prayer came up, rose up to God, but it didn't rise up to God until over the course of time they realized. So until they got linked with God on this situation, they were trying to make it the best they could. They were doing a lot of what we do. I'm trying to make it. I'm just trying to get by. It's like being caught in an ice storm. I'll never forget that because of the times that, that Thursday night when that ice storm came, they closed everything down. Some of those preachers did not get out of this city until Sunday afternoon. And I'm, we closed on Thursday, but it snowed and ice, 
It shut everything down this city. We were all just stuck here. We were prisoners, or they were, in Alexandria, Louisiana. Planes wasn't going. People couldn't drive. There was ice on the roads. And, of course, we don't have the equipment to deal with all of that. And they were trapped and locked into a circumstance that they could not get out of. I've been there many a time in the airport where I was supposed to preach or speak. One time, it was a very important funeral that I wanted, uh, if there's any funeral I've ever wanted to speak at, I was so honored to be asked to help preach Brother Norris' funeral in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was so honored. And Mickey and I got up to leave, and we were fogged in. And I told those people, look, whatever you got to do, fly me to Los Angeles, over to Nevada, whatever you got to do, get me there, please, please, please. But I was locked. That fog never lifted. And so I had to send my remarks, and they read my remarks at the funeral because I was locked into a situation that I could not control. It took them over the course of time before they realized maybe this is more than just being about Egypt and about a king and about what we have to work through. It may be something deeper than that. So what they do is they cry out about something is serious. Now I, now I cry out to you, God. Now I plead your blood. Their prayers went from, oh, God, thank you. Lord, we thank you for the way you bless us. God, you've been good to us. God, oh, God, we thank you, Lord. You're just a wonderful God. And we come here and do our praying. And I thank God for that. But we go through our, our Pentecostal catechism praying. But they reached a place to where this little now laid me down to sleep. Prayer was not going to work. The Bible says they cried out. In their desperation, they cried out. Until they reached the point of desperation. There was nothing to rise up to God. And you know you've reached the point of desperation. When it is clear God is your only hope. Tonight if I can convince you of one thing. God is your only hope. When you get to that point, And you look up and you begin to cry out to him. And you don't look at pastor or you don't look at any other counselors. And they're all good. And you can go to them and I'm fine for it and I'm fine for you coming to me. But when you realize the ultimate job and the ultimate duty that's going to be done is only going to be done by almighty God. You've got to understand you cry out to him. So what this tells me is that God will let things get worse until he gets our undivided, undistracted attention. And then when he got me pinned to the floor and I can't go any further, I've tried everything else and I've tried to go it every other way. Okay, Anthony, where are you going now? What are you going to do now? How are you going to handle it now? That's when I cry out, God, I have tried to handle this thing by myself. I've tried to take care of this thing by myself. But, oh, God, now I am on my face before you. And I'm saying, God, I'm crying out. I am trapped. I'm in bondage. But I go to church and I go to Bible study. I'm trapped and I'm in bondage. And here I am tonight. I'm trapped and I'm in bondage and I pay my tithe. I'm trapped and I'm in bondage and I give to the Lord. That's the difference here that I'm talking about of being religious and being spiritual. I am telling you tonight, just being at church on Wednesday night, just going through the ritual is not what God is looking for. When he sees where you are and what you are in, it's not that you're crying anymore about your situation, but you start crying out to him. God, you're the only one. You're the only one that can help me. If the issue is spiritual, God, don't let the physical get in the way. I don't want anything down here to get in my way, God. This is spiritual. And the children of Israel finally decided only God. God can fix this. We've tried all the human remedies. We've tried all this other stuff, and I'm still stuck. It's got that God got you stuck maybe for you to cry out to God. If your car fails you, you go to a mechanic. If your house needs repair, you call a handyman. If your body breaks down, you go to the doctor. If your clothes are torn, you go to a tailor. If your grades aren't good, you go get a tutor. What do you do when it seems like life breaks down and it seems like you can't go any further? You do what you would do with all those other things. You go only to God and you say, God, I can't handle this. God, I can't take care of this. God, this is bigger than me and I'm going to cry out. I'll knock on your door till you answer. I'll ring your doorbell till you answer. But I am desperate to get out of this bondage. I am desperate to get out of this fear. I am desperate to get out of this situation. And God, you're going to help me. 
Anything you use when it is spiritual issue cannot be something that gets in the way of God's participation. Anything you use to fix a problem in your life cannot be completed without the presence of God. I knew what I was preaching, that's why I used that line. It's the very beginning about the storm and God's presence. There is nothing like the presence of the Lord. I'm not saying that you never do anything, that there is no responsibility. But I'm saying it cannot compete with the power of the presence of God. They recognize their need for divine intervention. So how did this problem get solved? How does your problem get solved? Whatever it is that's holding you hostage tonight, it says their cry for help because of how bad things were, because of their bondage. So it took their bondage to make their cry, and they made their cry, and it rose up to God. But I hear what some people are saying. Listen to the most important part of your, my message tonight. You say, but I have prayed about it because I have felt trapped. Listen to the text. And God heard, 24, it's not on there, 224. If you'll throw it up there, I'd appreciate it. And God heard their groanings. And God, oh man, this is so strong. 24, if you would throw it up there for me. I've, I've got to show this church this this one word and God heard their groanings and God remembered his that is a very strong word and God remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob covenant this wasn't just an ordinary prayer this was a covenantial prayer. This was a covenant prayer. This wasn't just saying, Lord, I need a better job or give me a better job or Lord, I need more money or Lord, I need out of this situation. I need you to help me. No, no. This was a different kind of prayer because it got God to remember his covenant. The Bible says, and God remembered his covenants. There's all kind of theology here. I thought God didn't forget and I thought God was omniscient. He knows everything. What do you mean he remembered something that he's not supposed to be able to forget? How can you remember something unless you forget it? God remembered his covenant. This leads us to a little bit of the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments were a summary of the terms of God's covenant. And God's covenant had terms associated with it. Our conditions that had to be met before God would respond. Finish this scripture or get close to it. If my people, which are called. Then will I hear from heaven. So there was a covenant there. There was something that I had to do. There was some making that he had to do. So the conditions that I had to meet before God would respond. God tells Solomon, if the people turn away from me, then I will stop the rain. I will quit blessing them. But if they turn back, I will remember my covenant. He said, I'm going to cut the rain off. I'm going to cut the blessings off. But if they will cry out to me, I, I will remember my covenant. And I don't care how dark or how bad it looks. I don't care what you're going through tonight. And I know what some of you are facing. And it seems like the blessings have been called up. But God has sent me here to remind you. The same God that stopped what seemed like was a blessing. He said if they'll turn back and remember my covenant. If they'll give to me that covenant. I will in turn bless them. I'll pour rain out upon them. I'll pour blessing upon them. Go and accept that right now. Go and accept that right now. Say, I speak that into existence, Lord. I speak that into existence, Lord. So they didn't forget the covenant of sins that he couldn't remember it anymore. It was their crying out that reflected their willingness to operate under the terms of an agreement. He had to do with the terms of agreement. 
And what's happened to a lot of Christians is you've walked away from the terms of agreement that you've made with God. And you have conditions that you've made with God. And tonight, pastors just simply say, any, any condition, anything in that book or commandment that has been a part of your life, that no longer is a part of your life, tonight God is calling your pastor to call you back to that commitment and say, God, I made a covenant with you. And I am telling you tonight, God, I am in a situation, but I am returning to the covenant that you and I made. I am returning to the covenant that you and I made. And God, you're going to answer. I'm going to cry out to you. You're going to answer. God is going to say to them in Exodus chapter 19, 4 through 6. He says, now I'm going to lead you out of Egypt to be with me. Everybody say, lead them out of Egypt to be with me. Say with me. I'm going to free you from Egypt to be with me. Everybody say me. God said, I'm going to deliver you from Egypt so you can be with me. What I am going to deliver you from Egypt from is not just for you to get to Canaan land. I am delivering you from Egypt to be with me. He says, I am freeing you to be with me. I am not freeing you for you to skip me so you can just get to your blessing. We just want to go from Wednesday night at 8.06 to our blessing. God said, I'm not going to let that happen. You're not going to skip me. I'm the one. I'm the one that it's all about. Here I am right here. I'm the one that can bless you. I'm the one that can curse you. I'm the one that can handle your situation. I'm the one that can take care of you. I'm not going to let you just jump from Egypt to Canaan land or for you just to look up and say, bless me, Lord. No, it isn't about your blessing. It isn't about you being delivered. It isn't about what you're going through. It's about me. And Jesus is saying tonight, make it about me. Jesus is saying tonight, I want to be number one again. Jesus is saying, make it all about me. And when you make it all about me, we're going to cut a fresh covenant together to where I am going to deliver you from the circumstance or the situation that has you back. Here's what they want. They want to leave Egypt. They want to arrive in Canaan land, but they want to skip God. In other words, everybody wants a blessing, but they don't want the terms of the covenant. That's a pretty good line right there. We want the blessing without the terms of the covenant. To get the blessing, we got to keep the covenant with God. And when we keep the covenant, when I got baptized in his name, and it was circumcision of the heart, he placed me in the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the covenant of the New Testament church, and I am now covered with him. And you've got to keep those covenant promises. And you couldn't just leave Egypt, show up in Canaan, skip all the terms of the agreement. But how that covenant is an agreement with God makes with his people uh, a certain terms. A covenant has two sides. There is an unconditional side. The unconditional side means that God, is going to do A, B, and C, and D regardless of what you do. When you repent of your sin, you get the Holy Ghost, you're baptized in Jesus' name, and you're trying to live a halfway godly life, you're going to heaven. That is an unconditional plan. Now, I'm not eternal security, so don't leave here saying that. But I am telling you, when you're doing the best to live your life, you've been born again, your name's been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's an unconditional promise that when the trumpet sounds, you're going to be saved. Now that we understand, just like your children. There's some things, it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter how bad they are. You're going to make sure you cook for them. You're going to make sure they eat. You don't care what they've done. It doesn't matter what they've done. You're going to make sure that their physical needs are met. But when it comes to conditional things, when it comes to things of God, you, you, but within those unconditional covenants, there are conditional ones. And it's when they cry out to God, they cry out to him with a covenant prayer, which is why God remembered his covenant. He doesn't remember it because he forgot it. He remembered it because they are now operating in accordance to what he asked them to do. He doesn't remember it because he forgot it. He remembers it because now they're keeping up their end of the bargain. Good lesson, folks. Let me put it this way. One of the reasons people stay in bondage, even though they're praying to God, is they're not functioning in agreement with the covenant they made with God. 
And we are in covenant. The Bible calls it the new covenant, 1 Corinthians 11. So we are covenant, and the Bible says you don't function and agree with it. It says that some are weak among you, some are sick among you. Of course, it's speaking of communion there. But when you, when you look on down, it's called the cause effect. There's a cause and an effect. When they recognize things got so desperate, this is what God does. He lets things get so bad that you not only pray differently, but you pray in terms of the covenant. You pray not just getting loud. People do this when they are sick. Lord, if you will heal me, I will do anything. I have stood by many a people who said, God, if you will heal my husband, if you will heal my child, if you will get them out of this mess, then they make the pledge because we are desperate. We're desperate. I mean, people will live anyway. Multimillionaires would give away all their millions just to have their child live for another 60 years. There's, there's prayers there, of course. God knows if we're serious or not. But we cut those deals when? When we are desperate. That's people that are desperate. If somebody walked in here and told me that, that Mickey had cancer, she told me and, and had six months to live. You know, I, I thought I'd been praying pretty desperate, but you let me tell you something, folks. And some are here that's given up their loved ones, and they know what it's like. They got desperate in their prayers. The pain of the physical led to the recognition for the spiritual, and their cry was based on the fulfilling the terms of the covenant that God made with man, which involved them recognizing sin, which involved them restoring harmony with God. This is what I want to ask about your bondage. If you happen to be in bondage, are you fulfilling the terms of the agreement, the terms of the blessings with God? The covenant he says with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm just about done. But let me just say a word about that because it is rich. We are partakers of the Abrahamic covenant. At the heart of the Abrahamic covenant, God told Abraham this. I'm going to bless you so you can be, you got it, mother, where you can become a blessing. The fastest way to a blessing in the Abrahamic covenant of which we are partakers, the fastest way to being blessed is to connect with being a blessing. And when God realizes that when he blesses you, you're going to bless somebody else. He said, you're in my covenant. When he realizes that if he blesses you financially or he blesses your home or he blesses your children or he works this out for you, that you're going to take that and start teaching a Bible study or you're going to take that and start doing something for God or you're going to take that. He said, when I see that you're going to take when I bless you and you're going to pass that on to somebody else to be a blessing. When I see that you can take that blessing, that is Abraham's covenant. God said, I'm making a covenant with you so that you can bless other people. When God looks down on the POA and he looks at us and he sees a group of people that says, I can bless them. I will answer their prayer because I know they won't be selfish. And just like what pastor said tonight, and I'm just now putting this together. But me getting up here and saying, don't pray for God to turn that storm. I don't want that to be on somebody else. You know, the... That was a pretty good prayer, and I just did that this morning in prayer with, with the prayer group, and I felt like doing it tonight with you. We're being unselfish there. We're not asking God to turn it away from us and turn on some poor Pentecostals or other Christians or just atheists even over in Mississippi. I don't want anybody to have to go through flood and storms and wind. So I don't want to pray it away. I, want to pray. I don't want to pray it to turn. I want to pray for God to dissolve it. And if God does give us that kind of blessing, then we ought to take that blessing. God, you've been so good to me. You've blessed me so much. I'm going to give back what you've given me. I'm going to give it to somebody else. You've given me the gift of the Holy Ghost. God, I'm going to tell somebody else about it. You've blessed me financially. I'm going to bless somebody else financially. You've been a blessing to me. God, I'm going to bless somebody. That's the covenant of God. And when we get that kind of covenant and we get that kind of praying, you're going to see God do great, big, wonderful things. I'm going to bless you so you can be a blessing. So the moment you say to God, bless me, he has an absolutely no interest in that discussion. What he wants to know is you say, God, I want you to bless me so that I can go bless somebody else. That's the prayer I want you to start praying. Don't say, God, bless my family. You say that, but then I want you to add something else. God, I want you to bless my children. God, I want you to bless my marriage. God, I want you to bless my home. But God, when you do bless that, I'm going to use it to bless somebody else. 
when you bless me financially, I'm going to use it to bless somebody else because I'm in covenant with you. And when I'm in covenant with you, that's what it takes. And once God sees that being a blessing is not a vehicle for you just to be in blessed, he has absolutely no interest in prayers where it's just for your blessing. God says, I want you to remember my covenant to where when you are blessed, you will become a blessing to somebody else. Goodness, goodness, goodness. I got 30 more minutes and I'm not going to preach but four more minutes. Well, you see I'm going through it. Bye-bye. That was a good sermon there. Bye-bye. Good thought. See you later there. Covenant. God. Crying out to God. God, I got to have you. Making new commandments with you, God. I'm hooking up with you. That's what he's waiting on. Has anybody ever been trapped in an elevator? Have you ever been in an elevator? And it, I, I have been in an elevator. And I'm going to tell you what. I, I'm, a, I'm not a very, I, I don't fear a lot of things. What Mickey was talking about Sunday, a lot of that's true. And that's got me in danger things a lot. And I traveled with our policemen, especially when I came home 35 years ago. I was police chapman. Man, I got in with Newman Bob and... I went on all the drug busts. I loved it. And to find a trustee board, talk to me and ask me not to do that anymore because I was afraid I was going to get shot and killed. I just love, I love chaos and that kind. <laughs> but I was in an elevator. And that elevator got stuck. And there was two or three other people. Now they got to screaming. And they got to hollering. <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, God, the elevator's stuck. We're going to die. It's going to crash. It's over. And I looked, and there was a telephone hey. on the wall of that elevator. So in the midst of the crisis, what Mickey was talking about Sunday, I just simply get the phone, tell them they said they understand, it would be handled, they will fix it in just a minute or two. We were moving, and we were on our way, and everything was lovely. But I could have sat there all afternoon long and screamed and hollered and stomped and beat on the sides of the walls. That wasn't going to move that elevator. But when I got on that phone to the people that knew how to fix the elevator, knew how to take care of the elevator, they got the elevator moving. Now you can either stomp and kick and keep on going or you can stop and say, God, I made a covenant with you and I'm getting ready to cry out to you and you're going to hear my cry and you're going to hear my prayer and you're going to answer my covenant and I'm going to see a revival in my life. I'm going to see a revival in my home. I'm going to see you work in my situation. I am keeping covenant with you. Stand to your feet and give God a praise for the things that he's done. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know what I just feel like? I feel like this whole place becoming an altar tonight. I do this about once every two or three months. I just feel like this whole place becoming an altar. And so what I'd like for you to do is just turn around to three or four people, five, six people. Grab a circle. Let's all make a circle. Uh, y'all, y'all people here, y'all, y'all, Amy, y'all, y'all get with her, her daddy, her daddy, she's gonna have to have her, daddy. Jerry, y'all come up here and pray with the sneeze. Uh, her daddy's funeral is gonna be this week. Just get in a circle, that's it, man, make a circle with people all over this house. Look at this, 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 look at this. Look at this. Now, I want you to listen to pastor. Here's what we're gonna do, we're not gonna tell nobody our situation. You've got a hold of hands of people that I guarantee you in every circle, there's people who know how to pray. And what we're getting ready to do is, when I tell you and I give you the command, we're going to raise our hands and we're going to cry out to God. I don't want you to just say, oh God, Lord, that pastor taught a good lesson. I'm trying to do what he tells me to do. I don't understand all this holding hands stuff and business, God. You don't have to. I just want you to do what pastor tells you. And right now I want you to say to me, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, forgive me of any sin that I have committed. Forgive me of any wrong that I have done. 
God, I'm repenting of everything I've ever said or done. I'm asking you to forgive me. And now, God, that I have repented, you have forgiven me. And I accept that forgiveness. So I am not living under condemnation of sin at this point from you. The only condemnation is what I put on myself. Because you haven't come into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through you might be saved. So God, I am forgiven. So God, I am forgiven. So God, I am forgiven. And I am remembering the covenant I made when I made covenants with you when I was saved. And covenants that I made since I've walked with you that maybe I haven't kept. But tonight I'm picking those covenants back up. And I'm seeking you. And now God with my brothers and sisters. I'm getting ready to raise my hand and cry out to you. And you're going to move in my situation. Now the authority of the word of God and the power of the name of Jesus. Raise your hands and cry out to God. In the name of Jesus and ask God to move in every one of our situations. Listen to that devil. Listen to that devil. Listen to that cry of devil. That's with no music. That's nothing but the cry of the saints. That's the cry of your people in Egypt. That's the cry of your Israeli people in Egypt. We're tired of our bondage. We're tired of our stronghold. We're breaking through spiritual strongholds. We're breaking through spiritual strongholds right now. I break through every stronghold right now. I'm coming through every stronghold right now. I'm breaking through every stronghold. I am renewing my covenant with you. Say 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 go and talk in tongues. Pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. That's our motto for 2017. Pray in the spirit. Pray in the spirit. That's the cry of God's people. That's the cry of God's people. Listen to that devil. That's the cry of God's people. There's a shout from the children of Israel. There's a shout from the saints of God. There's a shout from God's people. You will hear our cry. You will hear our cry from bondage. We're only saying bless me so we can bless somebody else. You hear our cry tonight, oh God. You hear our cry tonight, oh God. I pray that blessing on you. I pray your prayers are going to be answered. I pray you are going to be delivered. I pray that you are going to be set free. I speak it in the name of Jesus. We are going to see deliverance in our children. We are going to see deliverance in our homes. We are going to see God work. Say 
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I claim it. I'm leaving here like a soldier tonight. I'm getting my covenant back. I'm going to make my covenant back with him. I'm going to be blessed to be a blessing. I will cry out. I will come out of this situation. You know what? I feel a shout in this house tonight. Just give a shout to God. Everybody say, I claim in Jesus' name. Pastor taught the word tonight, and I claim that word. He didn't preach his philosophy, he preached the word of God. I claim that word. You want the Holy Ghost, you want to be baptized, come down here, we'll pray with you. If not, we're going to have a great day Sunday morning. We're going to have a great time. So glad to see some of you from camp here tonight. Came to hear their pastors what they came to do, and I'm glad to hear. I love all y'all. Everybody say, I claim in Jesus' name. You got a covenant God. You got a covenant God. Everybody say, I got a covenant God. He keeps his covenant. I'll cry out till I get his attention. I'll break down every stronghold I got to break down. I'm coming out of it. I'm going through it. God's going to be with me. Hate to dismiss this service, so just leave when you need to leave. 